noted federal informant, social security benefits thief, and one-time heroin dealer for the New York mob, Frank Lucas died today at age 88. A man so uneducated he couldn't count, so he weighed the proceeds of his street-level heroin business before turning them into his mafia suppliers. He once put a contract out on his own brother's life. After many years of laying extremely low to avoid being killed by one of the many, many, many New York drug dealers he testified against and set up for arrest, Frank Lucas got lucky when a 2002 article appeared in New York Magazine written by Mark Jacobson entitled The Return of Superfly, which sparked a massive Hollywood interest. And in 2007, the film American Gangster was released to massive success. Mark Jacobson, the man you could say is most responsible for Lucas escaping the roach-infested tenement in New Jersey he was living in in 01, sat next to me in 2012 at the New York screening of my documentary, The Frank Matthew Story, and let's just say he didn't speak too fondly of Frank Lucas. Now, Frank Lucas was uh, uh, famously portrayed by Denzel Washington, and it's kind of a perfect example of what's wrong with getting your historical information from Hollywood movies. Now, Denzel is a true movie star, and he was mesmerizing as Frank Lucas. But the problem is, the real Frank Lucas was nothing like Denzel Washington. Denzel Washington is likable, handsome, intelligent. Frank Lucas really is none of those things. Now, uh, three central lies form the premise of American Gangster. The first lie is that Frank Lucas uh, didn't get his heroin from the mafia. He went to Southeast Asia and got it himself. Well, that's actually the real story of Leslie Ike Atkinson. Ike Atkinson was a retired officer living in Thailand when the Vietnam War broke out in between 1968 and 75. He and the French Connection were the two biggest dope suppliers to the U.S. and the entire world. Now, Frank Lucas may or may not have purchased dope from Ike Atkinson. I, I asked Ike this myself. He never met Frank Lucas. One of his middlemen may have sold him some sometime. We don't know. It's unclear. Uh, Lucas, though, certainly knew the story of Ike Atkinson, who served over 30 years in prison and was incarcerated when Lucas stole his story for, New for the New York Magazine ar article. Now, every single time Lucas was indicted in a drug conspiracy case, the suppliers in his case, his co-defendants, were the Italian Mafia. And the third lie is that Frank Lucas was smart. He wasn't. It was his brother Shorty who was the brains of the Country Boys operation. Uh, I think that's the same brother he put a hit out on at one point. And then there's the lie that he only informed on crooked cops. Well, he actually didn't inform on a single cop that there's any record of. Who he did tell on is lots and lots of black drug dealers in New York. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't think he told on any of the Italians who uh, he was supplied by slash worked for. He did so much telling that he helped the feds rig up one of the most ridiculous drug conspiracy cases I've ever heard of. He testified that three different guys, one of whom was a former lieutenant of Frank Matthews, who was the real American gangster. Uh, one was, uh, I think, Goldfinger and another guy. And they were all getting the cutting agents, the lactose quinine uh, that was used to cut heroin back then from the same supplier. Now, these three guys were drug dealers, but they didn't know each other. But thanks to Frank Lucas's testimony that they all were buying cutting agents from the same person, they were rigged into the same huge conspiracy case because they bought cutting agents from the same guy and Frank Lucas told the feds about it. Now what is true is that his brand of heroin, Blue Magic, is possibly the single biggest selling brand of heroin in Harlem history, and that's saying something. Um, but that doesn't mean he had any special heroin. He just cut the heroin that the Mafia gave him less than, say, Nicky Barnes did his. Frank Lucas talks about being Bumpy Johnson's chosen successor. It's well documented that Bumpy's wife and many others refuted that. I won't go into that. He, he was Bumpy Johnson's occasional flunky. Now, from the late 60s to the mid-70s, the country boys, Frank and his brothers, 
We're one of the bigger mafia supplied heroin dealing groups in the New York, New Jersey area. Uh, you, you know, he made a lot of money. But for example, that famous picture of him in the chinchilla coat that was taken at the Ali fight, well, that was actually put into uh, what, Ebony or Jet magazine. His pictures were smaller than the pictures of the guys from Detroit that I did another documentary on. Uh, Eddie Jackson and his crew, the documentary's called Motown Mafia. Mm -hmm. Frank Lucas is, is just one picture among many, and the Detroit guys and some other New York guys had bigger pictures. Go back. And Frank Lucas was nothing compared to Frank Matthews. Durham, North Carolina to Philly, operating out of Brooklyn at his peak. Watch my documentary, The Frank Matthews Story, to see who the real American gangster was. Now, Frank Lucas got paid $900,000 and a small house was uh, uh, purchased for him in exchange for the use of his name and life rights for the film American Gangster. He quickly ran through that money and he spent the last of his years of his life still on the hustle. Now, I'll leave you with this one last Frank Lucas story so you know just what kind of a guy he was. In 2011 or so, I was with Ron Chepsick, who was my partner with the Frank Matthews story. Ron did all the original research. And we were sitting in Ike Atkinson's little apartment with Ike. He was doing his laundry. Now, Ike Atkinson was a very nice guy when I met him, and he was living on his military pension because he had retired honorably from the Army years before he um, mixed himself up in the heroin business and earned himself the nickname Sergeant Smack. So we're there in his apartment and the phone rings. It was Richie Roberts, the real life New York cop played by Russell Crowe in American Gangster. Roberts had become a lawyer, just like in the movie, and he spent many years as friends with Frank Lucas, and he acted as, a, as, as his attorney during the period of the film. The reason for the call was to tell Ike that Frank was getting a felony conviction and being put on probation for stealing his own sons Social Security disability checks, cashing them and spending the money on women and whatever else. Criminals are often narcissistic lowlives. And while Frank Lucas was not the American gangster, but he certainly was one of the great narcissistic lowlives that ever came out of the streets. Frank Lucas dead at 88, not American dope. Special Agent Jerry Miller and Detective Roger Garay came to our office to break some bread with us and talk about a case they had called the Frank Matthews case. Once they got the wiretaps up on Matthews' phones, the feds quickly realized just how big of a fish they had caught in their net. They had a wiretap going, and I heard enough to know that we're not dealing here with an ordinary Brooklyn-based uh, drug operation. It's very huge. Nobody knew about this. I mean. You know, he was developing in his network. He wasn't even on the radar. They had no investigation going. He was making millions of dollars a year. And if it wasn't for one cop named Joe Kowalski, that investigation might have not have started for another 10 years. DEA quickly realized Matthews was setting up 100 kilo deals down in Venezuela with the French Connection, which would have made him one of the biggest heroin dealers in the country already at that point. We got calls with unbelievable people which I won't discuss that. The DEA office in Greensboro that I worked very closely with at the time got a phone call from a pharmacist, I believe, in Roxboro, North Carolina, reported to them that a black male uh, wanted to purchase, I think, a 55-gallon drum of mannitol, which is a cutting agent. That's when his name first came to my attention. So a federal team was formed consisting of DEA, IRS and federal prosecutors to go after Matthews. Much like what happened in, with the prohibition of alcohol in the 1920s, that gave birth to what we now know as organized crime in this country, uh, the so-called mafia. In the 1960s, there became a huge demand for drugs in this country. That gave rise to a new kind of organized crime, uh, what I call uh, drug kingpins or drug lords. When Frank arrived in New York, probably in 66 or 67, the city and the whole country was really going crazy. Crime had doubled in a few years. You had the civil rights movement, the war in Vietnam, and drugs. In 1959, there was about 100,000 heroin addicts in the country. 
By 69, there was over a million, and most of them were in the New York area. It became almost like a perfect storm. And I was thrown right in the middle of that in 1971. I had a front row seat to what was really going on in the drug game. In 70, 71, heroin was endemic. Entire blocks in Brooklyn, the entire apartment houses were addicted and small $10 packages of heroin was, was being used. And President Nixon was furious. With we must wage what I have called total war against public enemy number one in the United States, the problem of dangerous drugs. The president called all of us down to uh, the White House for a meeting on his drug abuse plan. He was livid with rage when I told him what was going on in Brooklyn. Uh, we had a heroin problem in the country and, and definitely in New York City. And heroin addicts created violence against innocent civilians. They'd come from Staten Island, New Jersey, Long Island, Connecticut. When you think about New York City in the 70s, I mean, you looked over your shoulder three or four times before you got to the train station or your car. I mean, it was a gangster town, you know? Nobody wanted to go to New York City. The politicians made a lot of noise, the media focused on that, which forced law enforcement to go after those guys that were dealing heroin. And of course, you couldn't have all that crime without police corruption. Some former pushers say police were more interested in getting their heroin than arresting them. On one occasion, I was dealing uh, drugs, and they came and, and took all my drugs and just let me go. Who's they? The police. Six weeks ago in Harlem, Black Panthers seized large quantities of heroin from drug peddlers and poured it into the street. They refused to turn it over to police because they insisted police would only resell it to the pushers. 